Well, terrific. Thanks again, everybody, for, for joining this evening. Uh, we have a really uh, special lineup this evening to, to talk about bees and beekeeping with a very special out-of-state, um, out-of-town guest, Dr. Debbie Delaney from University of Delaware. Um, I also would be remiss to, you know, not acknowledge all of the craziness that's going on outside and everything that we're experiencing, not just with COVID, but everything else. Um, and so hopefully this will be a, a little bit of a reprieve to think about something fun and not so heavy for a little while. So hopefully for the next hour, we can talk a little bit about bees and, and just remember just how cool they are and, and why we got into beekeeping. So um, the first segment that we uh, usually start off with in, in these Apiculture Onlines is a, a segment that we call um, Bees in Season, which is really just kind of giving a, a, a up-to-date, real-time uh, look about what bees are doing right now and what you should really be thinking about as a beekeeper. Of course, this is highly variable, highly dependent on where you're actually located. But um, in the end, I think the, the, as the seasons change, uh, the bees' behaviors change and therefore their needs uh, from us as beekeepers change as well. So here in early June, at least in, in the mid-Atlantic, uh, summer really has arrived uh, kind of with Memorial Day, I guess the unofficial start of summer. Um, but it, it hasn't really kind of arrived with a vengeance yet. It's, it's been warmer, uh, but not super hot yet. So um, I think the, the distinction about summer really being here is that the, at least in our area and many other parts of North Carolina and, and the region, the nectar flow is all but over. Um, it's, it's pretty much done. And Jennifer, um, who's out with the bees today, is really saying that the biggest indication of that is that robbing has really started to begin already. You know, when, when the bees don't have a really good nectar flow, they will very readily turn on each other because it's uh, a lot easier to steal honey than to make it. Um, and so stronger hives will, will very readily rob out um, smaller ones. And so I think that's just a forewarning then to make sure that, that you um, put your robber screens on early this year. Um, just be ready for that if you start seeing some snooping bees at the entrances of, of the colonies. If you don't have any robbing screens, get one per hive. Um, they're really uh, an invaluable piece of equipment that a lot of people don't use, but it, it really makes all the difference. Um, especially in, in midsummer, and so I, I definitely encourage you to do that. So if you don't have them, order them now so that you can put them on when, when you really need them. Um, Jennifer was talking last time about getting ready for the honey harvest and things to do, and so just to reinforce some of the things that she said two weeks ago, um, start moving those honey frames around in the supers. Um, bring those ones that are that are still needing to be capped, bring those more to the center so they can get ripened up and capped over so that um, you're, you don't have a lot of, of half capped frames when it comes to extracting. So make sure that you kind of move those around in an ideal way as she described last time to, to make sure that, that everything gets ripened up um, before everything really quits. One thing I wanna um, focus on though um, is keeping your eye out for problems. So you know, beekeeping in the spring is just downhill sledding. It's just so much easier. The nectar flow is on. They're growing like gangbusters. It's nice and warm, but not too hot, not too cold. And it just makes things so much easier in the spring. Once all of that's over, <laughs> then things get a little harder. And now it's kind of, you know, uphill sledding. And it just makes things more stressful on the bees and more stress results in problems that can crop up. And so some of the things that, that I wanna talk about, some of the first um, things that you can see as signs of stress in colonies are brood diseases, um, certain brood disease. And I'm gonna only gonna focus on a couple of them here, not to, to um, introduce kind of a, a downer topic, but, but really to, to underscore how these stress diseases can be distinguished from 
diseases that are more noxious and not due to stress and the bees can't really overcome them themselves. So the first stress disease is sac brood. And so you can see this when you, when you look inside the cells, the larvae um, often die facing outwards rather than curled up in a C shape like what you see um, in this cell right here. But they, they curl up and die in kind of this tough sac that's just kind of filled with fluid. Um, hence sac brood, because it's brood that just has this kind of, you know, bag of, of water almost. Um, and the, what causes it is a virus. And this virus is, is pretty prevalent. Um, and by and large, it's, it's around, but it's usually asymptomatic until the bees get stressed nutritionally or, or for other reasons. And so you can start seeing this crop up um, within colonies. Um, there's no chemotherapy. There's really no need for one. You can't um, put antibiotics on colonies to, to solve a, a problem with viruses, obviously. But the way to kind of have the bees get rid of this themselves is to just make sure that the colony is not stressed. If you think that they're stressed because they don't have enough food coming in, then providing some additional supplemental food, whether that be syrup or protein um, uh, pollen patties or something like that. Maybe the, colon, the hive is way too big for the colony, so they have too much space that they have to take care of, in which case maybe knock a two-story hive down into one story so that they, they're um, able to thermoregulate a lot easier and they don't have you know, such a big house to, to take care of. So things like that are, are ways that the bees can overcome a uh, sac brood on their own. A similar brood uh, pathogen is European fowl brood. And it's similar in the sense that it is often associated with stress from other stressors, uh, mostly environmental stressors that are going on. But unlike sac brood, this is caused by a bacterium. Well, it's actually caused by a, a whole suite of different microbes, but the, but the main um, bacterium is Melissococcus. And, and that often results in these kind of brownish and, and dying and decaying larvae that give off this foul odor, hence the term foul brood. Um, so again, seeing this often this time of year and, and throughout the summer, as I'm sure the, the apiary inspectors on, on, the, on the webinar can attest to, that uh, other stressors often result in this manifesting. And so, removing those other stressors, this uh, can, can go away. Usually not quite as easily as sac brood. Um, and because it is a bacteria rather than a virus, there are antibiotics that can be um, prescribed by a, a, um, a veterinarian so that you can apply and um, you know, kind of break the cycle of this particular uh, brood disease. But again, usually that's a, a kind of a last resort and um, something where if you just take care of those other stressors, then um, this can often go away, although perhaps not as easily. Now, I want to distinguish those two from this brood disease, which is American fowl brood, and is in fact such a noxious pathogen of honeybees that this is why the, the formation of the apiary inspection programs really occurred. Uh, it is also caused by a bacterium, but a completely different one, Penibacillus larvae. Um, and it's a spore forming bacterium that can hide out in combs, in woodenware, in honey um, for decades. And it doesn't take very many spores to infect an individual larva, and then that larva can grow billions of spores that can very easily spread throughout the colony. And there's really no um, kind of chemotherapy to prevent it, only to prevent the sporulation. So um, this is, when, a, when you have a really bad infection of American fowl brood, um, this can spread well within your colony, within your apiary, and to all your neighbors. And so it's really, really problematic and really the best um, prescription for this is just to burn all of the equipment and all of the combs. So you should never mistake those stress pathogens for this. This is not caused by stress. It's caused by being exposed to this particular bacterium. 
So really understanding the differences between these three things is critical, okay? So this table here that, that we see in our uh, beekeeping note 2.01 uh, um, on, our, on our website, extension website, really goes over some of the, the critical symptoms that are important to diagnose these different things. So really, um, if you see these kind of watery and granular sacs within the colony, then that's, it's pretty easy to distinguish sac brood from the other, from the two fowl broods, um, just by looking at that. So um, that one is pretty easy to diagnose. The difficulty is often between the two fowl broods, uh, distinguished between American fowl brood and European fowl brood. And so really one of the, the, the better ways to, to distinguish is that if the, if the larvae are dying before the cells are sealed, then that's usually associated with U European fowl brood. If you see, and we'll go back to this picture here, if you see a lot of these wax cappings of the brood that are then perforated, they're punctured, so the larva dies after capping, then that's usually um, almost always associated with American fowl brood, which is a real problem rather than the European. Um, once the American fowl brood uh, manifests really, really long time, they form these hard black scales. Once you're at the scale stage, your entire uh, hive, if not operation, is in real jeopardy. So um, finding these things early and addressing them early is, you know, um, an ounce of prevention is definitely worth a pound of cure here. So if you're interested in more of that or, or you're not really quite certain of how to distinguish these, um, uh, go to the, the bee, our beekeeping note, um, do some reading online, find different pictures to make sure that you're comfortable in seeing these things in your hive. Hopefully you don't, but uh, if you do, it's really important to act quickly. And of course, when in doubt, contact your apiary inspector. Now, it's really important again as beekeepers for us to be thinking ahead um, so that we can prepare our bees one to two brood cycles from now so that they can be um, well prepared for what's going to happen. So looking three to six weeks from now, prepare for it to get hot. Um, just like I was saying kind of last time, look out for other problems. Um, a lot of queen problems can, can occur this time of year, especially with overwintered queens. So stay vigilant on those older queens, those that weren't reared and mated this year. Uh, but also start to think about um, your water sources. You know, when, they, when it starts to get hot, the bees need to collect a lot of water to keep the hive cool. So if you're in a location that doesn't have a good, close, clean, and ideally running source of water for them to be able to collect without drowning in, to bring it back to the hive, then now is the time to really start thinking about that so that they don't overheat or become too stressed during the summer. Uh, before we go to the next segment, I, I want to make a really brief announcement, especially uh, to all of you who are on the, the webinar this evening who may be in their first year of beekeeping. Um, we decided kind of at the last minute to have a very special uh, bees school um, for first year beekeepers only. So the idea here is that it's just going to be one Saturday in July, so it's going to be about a month and a half from now. And the idea is to enroll, but it will be live in the sense that we will have um, direct uh, um, presentations, just much like what we are doing this evening. Uh, but we'll also break into groups and have discussions and other activities, all targeted at those of you who just started your hides for the very first time this year. And it's been going really, really well because it's been spring. But then as summer keeps going, it comes harder and harder. And so we're, tr we're going to have this discussion about how not to get discouraged, some of the real things to look out for, and some of the things to go into winter so that your bees can make it through the winter so that they don't die off and you get frustrated and quit. So if you or anybody that you know might be interested in something like that, uh, we're going to open the registration probably in about a week or two. Um, and set the date for July 18th for um, this kind of one day uh, primer for first year beekeepers. 
And so with that, we'll move to our second segment. And our second segment actually is going to be um, combined with our third. Our second segment is timely topics where we have a presentation on, on different aspects of bees, their biology and beekeeping. And this year, based on some suggestions by, by some of the uh, YouTube attendees, um, we're gonna talk about genetics, or really we're gonna be talking about the different types of bees and their characteristics. And so we're so lucky tonight to be joined with our guest interview by Dr. Deborah Delaney, who's my um, a, a counterpart, extension apiculturist at the University of Delaware. Uh, and she is an expert in the different types of bees, population genetic diversity and population genetics um, and phylogenetics. And so um, I've been able to convince her to be able to present this timely topic as she best sees fit. And so Debbie, I'll turn it over to you and say, say hello to everybody. All right, well, thank you very much, David. Can everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to talk to you guys. Um, all right. So, um, and when David asked me to talk about this, I was thinking, oh my goodness, um, I probably have very old slides um, about this. Um, and then, of course, I had to put a little humor in there and talk about bee diversity. And, um, oops, I always forget I have to use these arrows down here. Um, I want to start broadly because there's a lot of bees on this planet and they are really amazingly cool. Um, all different colors, all different behaviors. Most of them are solitary. Um, they um, not only are cool looking, but they have really neat behaviors and, and nesting substrates. This is actually a nest that was made by um, a solitary bee that uh, actually chewed flower petals and, and glued those petals together to make her nest for her young. Um, and you can see there's just so many different bees, twenty over 20,000 different species. And so I wanted to talk about just the huge diversity we have and narrow down um, into talking about honeybees. Um, and if we think about it, uh, in another way, just looking at the diversity of bees, the largest bee we know of is this uh, Wallace's uh, B, the Megachyla Pluto, um, with a 2.5 inch wingspan. I mean, this is a big B. Um, not to mention the mandibles are pretty amazing. Uh, you can just start to see them up here. Um, and then we have this little tiny Perdita, um, Perdita minima, which is the smallest bee. It's also a solitary bee, about two millimeters long. So not only are there so many different colors, you know, different textures, furry to a kind of hardened exoskeleton, we also have an enormous size range. And you can think about how they've evolved with different plants species um, and utilizing different types of floral blooms um, in order to get their needs met like nectar and pollen etc because that's one special thing about bees they all absolutely require floral resources now if you're like me um, and I think a lot of beekeepers are this way um, you're kind of anal retentive <laughs> in a way. And, um, and if you're an entomologist, I think you just are this way. You like to classify things. You like to put things into categories. Like things go with like things. Um, and in order to really understand the diversity of bees, this is exactly what we must do. And so I'm going to put this question, since I can't put it out to everybody, though you can think about it in your mind, I'm going to put it out to a smaller audience here. Why do you think it's important to classify our group bees? or any living thing for that matter. Because it's painstaking to do it. Anyone? Yes, so you can understand the relationships among, um, among them all and how they fit into the local ecology. Okay, so understanding how they fit into the local ecology and, and so we can get a good count of how many species exist, right? And so we don't maybe lose sight of a particular species. Um, in conservation efforts, if we don't know something even exists, how can we even look to see if we need to conserve it? Um, so it's really important that we classify and understand the level of species diversity that we have in order to protect those particular, especially vulnerable species. Um, and so if we look at the traditional taxonomic classification system, you probably all 
made some type of song or something in your head to memorize this in biology. Um, but it's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And this is something that's been ingrained in us. And, you know, when we're teaching taxonomy of any type of organism, it follows along these taxonomic, this hierarchical kind of um, levels or, or designations. And one thing that's kind of confusing, especially when you look across all of life's diversity, is what is truly a species. And I think many of us who are in the scientific disciplines, this is probably a question you've been posed, uh, or that's been posed to you in a number of your different classes. And what, this is kind of a rhetorical question, but um, I would like to get some people's opinion. Is the species designation refined enough to understand diversity? What do you think? There's probably different points of view here. I mean, I, I would say that it's, uh, um, there's always exceptions to the rules. So it's probably not refined enough, but it's um, an easy, it's the idea that a species is only something that can interbreed with, it, with itself um, is a pretty uh, um, simplistic way of doing it, but it's the best we got. Yep, that's right. And I think it's important for us to think about what our questions are and what do we want to find out about something in order to see if species is going to be um, robust enough in order to answer our questions. And when I think about a species, um, other, I'm a, an, in a department that's part wildlife and part entomology, and they think anything below species is kind of ridiculous, the wildlife people. And I tell them as an entomologist that it's very important that we understand subspecies and that we have subspecies. And hopefully I'll be able to kind of relay that to you um, as I go on and talk um, throughout the rest of this uh, presentation. But if we look here, can you think of why we would need to have further taxonomic designations? And I already kind of answered that. Look at the tiger subspecies of the world. And we know how endangered tigers are. Um, these populations are dwindling every year. Um, there's a lot of different breeding programs. And if we didn't understand these different subspecies that are specifically tied and have kind of co-evolved in specific habitats, then we wouldn't be able to put the conservation efforts in to try to breed them, to keep them alive, to keep them from going extinct. So I'm going to suggest for the rest of this particular talk that we look at this reclassification um, where we actually add subspecies on because in honeybees, which is why I think we're all here to talk about honeybees, subspecies designation is extremely important and valid. So if we just kind of run through looking at this taxonomic classification, you know, if we looked at particularly Apis mellifera, we know that it's the kingdom Animalia, the phylum Arthropoda, class Insecta, um, order Hymenoptera, family Apidae, sub, if you wanted to go to subfamily, um, Apinae, but genus Apis, species mellifera, and then the subspecies, and we're gonna talk about many of them, um, would be Apis mellifera lagustica. Um, so it's a trinomial. So it's three kind of parts to the name. And that's really what makes a subspecies unique. And one important thing about subspecies too is because taxonomic classification is Latin, it's universal. All bee researchers all over the world can use these subspecies names and understand what the other one's talking about. Um, so that's really, really important. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about the nuances. So really quickly, I wanted to go just in the genus Apis. Like I said, we're going to start broad and narrow in. And within the genus Apis, I'm not going to go too crazy here, and there's actually more species, but I wanted to highlight um, just some of these species groups. Um, we have this kind of Serrana species group. We have the weird, strange outlier, <laughs> the Apis mellifera. And both of these can be kind of grouped as cavity nesters. 
right? Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the relationship in a few slides. But then we move on to the dorsata species group and the Floria species group, which we know are more open nesting species. And we know through phylogenetic analysis that um, Floria and dorsata are some of the more um, basally oriented uh, bee groups on the phylogenetic tree. Um, they're more ancestral. And, and not only do we see that just with their kind of open nesting behavior, but also some of their other kind of social behaviors as well. And so I'm just going to show some pictures because they're so pretty. I've never seen them in person except like dried shriveled pin ones. But you can see this is a picture that was taken um, up close of this open nest of Apis dorsata, the giant honeybee. Um, and this is what these open nests look like. Oftentimes you'll find many nests on a tree or on a cliffside. And then we have the dwarf honeybee. And typically these nests are, you know, I could hold onto either side of that branch, holding it up in between my head. You know, these are not large. These bees are much smaller. And this makes them much easier to kind of take and bring to market. And, you know, they, they actually can be over harvested. Um, because there's a lot of good resources in this nest that can provide communities with protein and sweets and all sorts of good things. And I love this picture. I'm sure some of you have seen it on the internet and just showing you the size difference between uh, the giant honeybee and the dwarf honeybee. Um, and it's, it's pretty drastic. Now, if we move now on to the cavity nesters, Apis serrana is really interesting. And oftentimes, like this, because I know this is a picture of Apis serrana, um, it, it, it's obvious to me. But there's been pictures that I've seen that people would be like, what subspecies, or, you know, what bee is that? And I'm just like, uh, Apis mellifera, you know some subspecies instead of like a different species. Um, and Serana, also known as the Indian honeybee, is thought to be the sister taxa to Apis mellifera. Um, and of course, we've gotten lots of um, pests and pathogens that have host shifted from Serana to mellifera. Um, and what is known just from genetic analysis is that Apis serrana and mellifera um, isolated from one another during the last glaciation. And you'll see that kind of these larger global phenomenons really have not only kind of shaped and created the diversity within, this, within the um, genus, but also within the species. So this is an old map, but it's still a good one. And this whole pink area here is Apis mellifera's native range. Um, and here in the green and here in the hexagon, the green is Apis serrana, and the hexagon is Floria and dorsata. So you can kind of see that they have separate ranges. Um, and they don't overlap naturally. Uh, now they overlap because we've moved them all over the place. But this is what they would have looked like without our kind of movement and kind of intervention. And now kind of zoning in on the species Apis mellifera. Uh, gosh, the work probably started in the 40s and 50s with uh, Rutner, um, where he really started to look at differences in bees. Um, and based on morphological or kind of um, physical differences as well as behavioral differences, he was able to start um, designating different subspecies of Apis mellifera. And now with the um, also, we have the tools of molecular analyses. We know that there's over three dozen recognized subspecies. So we've learned a lot. Um, so let's talk a little bit about morphology and, and behavior because um, these particular, the way they look and the way they behave has been shaped by the vast, vast climates and ecologies that Apis mellifera inhabits. If you remember that that um, picture I just showed you of their range. Africa, Europe, that's a huge range for a species with all different types of climates and ecologies. So you can imagine that those environmental forces really have helped to shape those bees over decades and decades. 
And I talk to my students that it's a lot like neighborhoods, right? Um, here you can see this is ethnic groups by region in terms of humans. Um, but now let's look at this overlay. These are subspecies of bees um, over these same regions. And so just like we have um, cultures being formed um, due to different environmental stimulus and over time, different languages, we also see differences in bees in their behaviors and their ways to communicate and their ways to interact with the landscape, which I think is really cool. Um, and I don't expect any of you to read this, but this is just if you're recording it or if you wanted to look at this more up closely, you can see all the different subspecies here and find the color on the map. And really, we can kind of give this success of Apis mellifera, because if you think about how, what, is, what makes an organism successful, is their ability to kind of proliferate, right, in, in, in all different types of climates and all different types of environments. And because honeybees are cavity nesters, because they are able to thermoregulate their homes better than my air conditioner or my heater, um, they, we can move them all over the place, right? Because um, they're like, okay, you're going to put me someplace cold? Well, we'll just all get together and you know move our wing muscles and generate heat right um, so that's really what's led to the success of apis mellifera and the ability for them to naturally inhabit a large range and for us to kind of also move them and them to be successful in an even larger um, human imposed range so I already alluded to this, but these possible mechanisms that's led to these different neighborhoods or subspecies of honeybees is really these larger global phenomenons um, like glaciation. Um, and this really has led to the rise of different subspecies in Europe, um, Apis mellifera mellifera. Apis mellifera iberiensis, Apis mellifera carnica, Apis mellifera lagustica. And also, if we look at some of the subspecies that exist in Africa, um, also isolation to desertification, as well as changes and shifts in vegetation due to precipitation changes over time. So morphometrics is really cool. And people who do morphometrics must have a lot of patience because literally it's looking at hundreds of bees from different samples um, and measuring different parts of their body or observing different types of behavior and then kind of marking that all down. And this is really what started morphometry and the whole subspecies designation in Apis mellifera in the 1940s. And behavior differences can be things like dance language. We know a lot, especially at the species level, um, uh, with the, within the dance language. It's different depending on if you're um, Lagustica or Carnica, supposedly have different dialects, right? Foraging behavior, overwintering, propolis collection, a lot of these things that we actually select for to have, you know, to have these different traits in our bees, these are behavioral differences that exist in the world of bees. Also, in terms of the morphometric part where you're measuring parts of the body. So this is what it would look like. You'd have this Petri dish, you'd line up all your bees and you're measuring tongue length. You're looking at the width of the abdomen, maybe the width of the thorax that's housing the muscles. Wing angles are a huge, huge, very informative um, measurement to divide bees into different subspecies. There's tons of different things that you can measure. And that's precisely what was done um, in uh, early on, starting in the 1940s, like I said, and, and continuing on. And really what they found based on morphometrics is that there's different lineages of honeybees or lineages within Apis mellifera. And they lump them into this A lineage, which you can see is, is Africa, M lineage in Western Europe, the C lineage in um, Southeastern Europe, O lineage, and then the Y lineage. Um, so these are just some ideas of how morphometrics has been able to understand the evolutionary like trajectory and diversity of Apis mellifera. not moving. Go, be free. 
Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. And what's even cooler than that, this is work that's done painstakingly looking at behaviors, looking at morphological features. Well, years later, with the advent of genetics and molecular assays and tools, they were able to show support for these lineages, for these subspecies designations using molecular analyses. Um, and so Friedrich Rutner was right on, right? And even though he didn't have all these fancy tools, um, the way he did it also was supported through the use of molecular tools. So um, I've talked a little bit about bees in their native range, and now I want to move over to the bees that we're more familiar with, which are the bees in the Americas. And I'm not going to go into too much of the history here because um, I'm just going to go right into the subspecies that we know have been brought to uh, North America and the approximate date when they when they were brought here, supposedly. Um, and we have Apis mellifera mellifera. You can see that all of these are subspecies. They're trinomials, meaning they have three names associated with them. And then you can see the arrival date. This is based on ship's logs, journal entries, etc. cetera. Um, so this is the earliest dates that we have for knowing that these were intentionally brought in to North America. Um, and these different colors kind of represent those lineages that I was talking about. Apis mellifera, this kind of Western European, Lagustica, the Southeastern European, um, the yellow uh, representing African lineage, and then um, the Cypria, Syriaca, and Caucasica, more this Oriental kind of lineage. And we know that in the US, there's really two different groups of honeybees. These are commercial populations that are managed by queen breeders, um, by beekeepers, people who are selecting for traits. They're starting with some type of known stock and then specifically selecting down for particular traits. Um, feral populations, now when I say feral in my meaning, it's more that these are any colonies or nests that aren't maintained um, for those purposes, where the genetics aren't being controlled or being selected for. And really, if we think about commercial populations, um, what has we've been told, um, and I think this is mostly true, and, and, and genetic evidence supports this, that it's mostly Apis mellifera glagustica and carnica. Um, this is typically what you are um, offered, at least at, now we have some new selected lines, uh, which we'll talk about that too, but throughout kind of uh, U.S. beekeeping history, these are the two main subspecies that generally have been offered for you to buy. Now, feral honeybee populations that coexist and really coexisted before the early 1990s um, were more diverse in terms of their subspecies makeup. And so we have Apis mellifera lagustica and carnica, but we also have Apis mellifera mellifera. And I also want to point out that even within the subspecies designation, there's even further diversity. Okay, so Apis mellifera mellifera in its natural range covers a large portion of Western Europe. And there's certain ecotypes that have actually evolved for these particular regions, these ecoregions. So there's even diversity within the subspecies, which is mind boggling. So when I was at NC State um, working with David and Jennifer, um, we started this feral bee project and it was really fun. Um, we got to go around and basically people put these pins on a map and told us there were honeybees there and then we would go and collect some because uh, we wanted to know what was around essentially. And um, what's really interesting is that when we actually looked at those bees, it wasn't until I got back to um, or to University of Delaware that I was able to find somebody who was very good at doing morphometric analysis on wings. And so I was doing a lot of molecular analysis, but I wanted them to look and compare these kind of unmanaged bees and managed bees that we collected in North Carolina to the true subspecies types that supposedly we derived these bees from in the beginning, 
long, long ago. And um, let me kind of walk you through this. Hopefully I made it somewhat simple to understand. It's simple in my brain, but my brain is not your brain. So um, this blue bubble here, this contains samples um, that were kind of feral bees, ones that we knew weren't managed by anything, um, and as well as managed colonies. So the, the blue represents these natural environment bees, these managed bees represent the green and um, the red uh, squares. And um, now these bubbles here, now these dark circles, this is Caucasica, so Apis mellifera caucasica, also known as the Caucasian bee, and also Apis mellifera mellifera. And so they group together um, on the morphometric analysis. If you take true subspecies from those, that particular subspecies, Okay, and then if you look at Carnica and Lagustica, they group together um, with their wing angles on this bottom circle. And what's really interesting is that all the bees we collected in the United States, none of them are overlapping with the true subspecies that they were originally derived from. Um, so, I mean, this is my interpretation and it could totally be wrong, but I'm just going to tell you this is my opinion here, that we have mutts. And we have these mutts that have traits from both of these groups. And that's because we've, we've bred them and they've bred naturally and we've um, intentionally bred them for a very long time, people, okay? Um, so I think this is kind of exciting. And you know, I'm, I love rescue dogs, mutts rock, okay? Um, hybrid vigor, um, mutts are great, it's very good. All right, so I did want to go into the weeds a little bit here and talk about selected strains, lines, and hybrids. Um, and also desirable traits. And if we think about selected strains, um, what's really interesting is that in that diversity that I've been kind of talking about is absolutely essential for us to be able to do any selective breeding. We need to have that diversity um, in order to have differences in pest tolerance or pest resistance in, in swarming behavior and overwintering and, and the ability to make honey. And so it's the diversity, this awesome diversity that we have that it's allowed us to create some different bees, which I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. Now, um, what's really interesting is I'm gonna start with the hybrids. And I don't know if any of you remember Midnight and Starline, but this is so cool. I was looking at this and the prices, one to 24 queens, um, like $1.90, I think, for one to 24 each, right? Um, and I love this, Midnight. Finest Caucasian hybrid available, still gentle as a kitten. <laughs> Anywho, um, so these are no longer sold, but a little history there. These were some of the first hybrid lines. These were created after World War II by Daydant, um, and they were trying to make um, these bees that combine different, you know, uh, uh, different subspecies that had different traits to make these extra great bees that worked better, that were bigger, etc. Another real common or familiar hybrid um, that you can still find today is Buckfast. This, of course, was created by Brother Adam. Uh, I'm not going to go into the history there. Um, but then we have some selected strains as well, like Russians, that were actually intentionally sought after um, for possible varroa tolerance and resistance and actually brought to United States and bred. And then we have this varroa sensitive hygiene, um, the suppressed mite uh, resistance as well, um, which are, you know, something that you also can buy today, which is a definite behavior that's associated with um, pathogens, uh, varroa mites as well. And then also the Minnesota hygienic line. And so these you can see are different than when we talk about subspecies. And I feel like we get confused with lines, races, subspecies. And when we're talking about subspecies, this is, this is real, like nature created these over time, right? And so these are something that we did not create. Um, and any hybrid selected strains or lines, these are things that we intentionally kind of created to make a better bee essentially. 
All right. I don't know if I went over. I'm sorry, David, if I did, but I think that's all I had. No, that, that's quite all right. I think it fit uh, well within the half hour. Um, and so what we normally do with these last 15 minutes is just to open it up to questions, um, just to give some people uh, time to, to type in questions on, on the YouTube. Um, really excellent presentation, Debbie, and excellent work. I'll start out with, with the first question here, which really goes back to your work based on the managed and the unmanaged populations here, here in North Carolina, um, we, we get this discussion a lot. You know, somebody finds bee, honeybees living in a tree and they've been there for, you know, the last 20 years, according to their grandfather or whatever. Um, and so the, the question always comes up, are those types of bees, are they survivors from like the Mayflower days? <laughs> Or they escape swarms from our bees and they're just reoccupying that nest or something else? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I will say that they could be either escape swarms, most likely escape swarms, um, rare but could be um, a remnant from long ago. But I can tell you from, I think, how many did we collect? Like, 600 or something different it was, it was a pretty large number and out of those i would say less than a hundred were remnants so and they were typically in these isolated gigantic trees that randomly fell because of a storm event or 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 something it was just so old and it, they it was very rare um to find them. So I think most of the time, even if you know those bees, you've seen them there every year after a year, um, none of us can be there present all the time. And, and a lot of times they'll swarm and swarms will move in. Mm -hmm. um, but so I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, no, I mean, I think um, it, it did in the sense that it's not guaranteed that it's just a survivor, right? Oh, um, right. It's also not a guarantee that that all of the original population, right, that were brought over in the 1600s were wiped out. That's right. So, you know, so, and, but it's impossible to tell without genetic or very, very careful tests, right? Like you can't Absolutely. just look at it and just say, yep, these came off the Mayflower or nope, these were just ordered from Hawaii two years ago, right? You yeah, they're wearing little pilgrim hats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Exactly. Um, yeah, no, it's very hard to tell. Um, and, you know, there's only been a few times where I was like, I don't even need to run genetics on these. And that's, <laughs> you know, and that's because they're like these dark, like mm -hmm. mean, <laughs> weird right. little bees. Yep, yep, um, yep. But no, absolutely right. I think the majority of what we find, and also so many of the bees that are out there existing in trees and existing in spots, we don't even know that they're there. Mm -hmm. We just see the ones that are more obvious and more conspicuous. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not even getting a true idea of what actually exists yeah, out there. No, that's a great point. And you still have that Save the Hives.com website. Is that is that the address? What is no? No. Um, no so the, the Save the Hives was, you, you know, David, um, mm -hmm. a very smart man um, who was associated with SAS um, mm -hmm. helped to put that together. And he um, was no longer going to be maintaining it. Um, and I'm not savvy enough to okay. maintain it. So I, I it, wasn't it, sure if Delaware took that over or not. Yeah, um, no, we didn't that, end up taking bad. that over. Well, here's another citizen science project that we can uh, renew somehow if people right. want to go out and merge their love of honeybees and bird watching and geocaching. I know, this, I was going to say together. geocaching. It's the, it's, the, it's the perfect thing to do. Um, Sharon, uh, any questions for Debbie um, coming in on the... Uh, There's the, several. Uh, great. There's several for both both the original session and then uh, her, her talk. Okay. Um, it's uh, one of them is if you could work with any specific species or subspecies of bee, any type of bee in nature, not in the lab, what species would you like to work with? Is that for David or for well, me? That's for you. <laughs> Definitely for you. Is <laughs> that for Don? No, I'm joking. Um, uh, a, a nice one. Um, you know, one thing that I have noticed too is um, I've worked with Africanized bees that 
I couldn't believe how okay they were. Mm -hmm. And I've also worked with bees that I I did the genetics. They were, you know, Italians and they were evil. So <laughs> um, I don't necessarily trust subspecies as a complete identifier of behavior um, all the time. Because like I said, there's a lot of variability within a subspecies. Well, which ones have the reputation of being, let's just say the least defensive versus, I mean, Africanized bees have notoriously right. high defensive, right? Which yes. are the ones that are um, usually the calmest? Um, I would say for me, the ones that I've been able to work with, I've really liked um, Italians and Carniolans, mm -hmm. you know, or our version of them here now. Mm -hmm. um, they've been selected for the, the traits that we like mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. centuries here um and you know there's certain things i don't like about each of them like i i agree italians can be a little piggy mm -hmm. um you know i also agree that um carniolans can kind of co come on a little slower mm -hmm. um and so but those are the two that i've had th the best success with Great. another question sharon yeah um <laughs> Is it really worth buying a certain strain of bees when, like you said, on a mating flight, the queen can mate with any drone around? So you don't put uh, quickly, don't you quickly lose the genetics? Yeah, I think that the key is to, I, I don't think you should be looking to buy a bee because it's a particular subspecies or a particular strain. I think you should be talking to the people you're buying your bees from and asking them what they select for, how they're kind of selecting for it. I mean, bees anymore are expensive. <laughs> and if you're going to put that money in to buying bees, you should know how they're being raised and what they're being selected for. Mm -hmm. Um, you should know if, uh, like how often they use treatment and what type of treatment, because maybe you'll find out that if you discontinue that treatment, your bees are going to die. Right. And mm -hmm. so you're going to want to know a little bit behind the scenes about the bees you're purchasing. And I would say just buy the bees that have the traits that you want. Um, and I would, I would ask them. I, I do. Yeah. And then try them and then if you don't like those right. traits try another because there's plenty out there yeah, yeah usually when i hear of a new breeder um i'll get like if i can get on their waiting list because everyone seems to have a waiting list i'll get like two nukes um and just you know in case one's a lemon you know because mm -hmm. there can mm -hmm. be that lemon yeah. um and i don't have tons of money so um i usually just get two and then i can give them a try Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important to, to just kind of try them out and see yeah. if you like them. Yeah, that's great. Um, some other questions, Sharon? And I know we're not going to be able to get to them yeah, all, so um, sorry if we can't get to yours. Okay. Um, has there been any effort to genetically manipulate with genetic vectors, for example, um, bees, like adding particular characteristics such as resistance to viruses in bacteria? Oh, there's been all sorts of, you know, if, if you're asking if there's been selection for disease resistance and, and pest resistance, then I would say yes, um, in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, but that's, I think, that's for traditional breeding. I right. think the question is really about genetic manipulation. Oh, uh, like, like genetically like modified? Yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. um, not that I am very aware of or know much about. Um, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. David, do you know or? I, I do. There, there are a couple labs that have used it as a technique not to create a GMO bee, but to learn more about the genetics. So they, they do things like they, they target a, a, a specific gene to turn it off to mm -hmm. see how important it is, but never with the intent of, of releasing that to the environment. And there are very strict controls against that. So other than that, no, nobody is working on a Franken bee. Um, <laughs> but as Debbie said, there are really excellent breeding programs that do it kind of the traditional, natural, old fashioned way to select for different types. Okay. Yeah, that, that's an important distinction. Go ahead, Sharon. Mm -hmm. um, 
this says um, a couple of people want to know more about SAS, uh, Saskatras. I'm sure I'm not saying that right, but um, a couple have asked what your opinion is on them um, in general. Yeah, so we got some Saskatraz queens last year um, in this um, beekeeping collective that I'm associated with down in West Virginia. Um, and honestly, um, we were super excited to try them and we haven't seen any um, major differences from some of our other good producers. Um, and, you know, some of them did over winter, some of them didn't. So it's kind of, um, also what my technician here also got some Saskatraz last year. Um, but like I said, and we didn't do a study on them, you know, we weren't looking and evaluating a bunch of them. This is just like one or two. So I don't think I can give you a whole lot of information on that particular uh, line. We did a, a very similar thing last year. Um, Jennifer got, I think it was like 10 Saskatraz and we, we'd actually did a um, kind of side-by-side -side comparison, not at the colony level, but looking at um, kind of brood um, mm -hmm. traits and stuff. So Jen, what was your take on, on the Saskatraz? What were they most similar I, to? I don't remember them being anything different than what we um, had originally. They were, they did fine. They didn't do yeah. great and they didn't do horrible. They were just like your average and I, you know, I'd do it again. If somebody offered, I'd take mm -hmm. them. I wouldn't <laughs> necessarily pick them over one of the other mm -hmm. ones. Well, they, they, they were started kind of from a, a Russian hybrid almost in a breeding program in Canada. So I think they're specifically attuned to um, mite uh, tolerance and winter hardiness, right? But being average is a darn good thing when it comes to honeybees. Yeah. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but again, try them. If you like them, keep using them. Right, if they work yeah. for you, that's really right. the, the only important question thing. Yeah. Yep, that's that's exactly right. I mean, I know um, people who, you know, have hives that I wouldn't want to keep um, right. just because they're spicy, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm -hmm. But they are production machines, mm -hmm. um, and they don't mind them. They love them. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely like you know, as long as you don't live next to a school with small children <laughs> or something like that, or animals that are tied up mm -hmm, <laughs> right next to it, mm -hmm. then um, I think it's a personal opinion, yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly. So let's see if we can get one, maybe two more in here, Sharon. Okay. Um, to give her a break for a second, um, are the risks for hive problems of EFB and AFB variable to the different zones in North Carolina? Western in particular uh, is a question here. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would I would almost certainly say not, unless uh, Don or any of the inspectors would like to uh, correct me on that. Um, I don't think it's that um, regional when it comes to that. Now, certainly some of the stressors can be different um, in different regions of the state, but I think um, these diseases are ubiquitous. You're going to find them throughout the entire, you know, North, North America. And it's not that we have pockets. Now, of course, you can have um, changes over time in different regions of how prevalent they're going to be, but that's not as predictable. Would you agree with that, Don, or is that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, we do get outbreaks here and there, but... Uh, no, America. But it's not consistently in the mountains or consistently right. on the coast, right? It's right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So I think in in general, it's the it's the stressors, right? And those stressors can change based on changing environmental conditions year to year over the course of the season. And so, um, staying on top of those and staying ahead of those is really the best way to hopefully ne just never see them. Let's see if we can get one more in, Sharon. Well, maybe not. <laughs> um, well, uh, I think just for the sake of time, um, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap things up. Um, another successful outing. Thank you so much, Debbie Delaney, oh, for, for joining us and what a fantastic presentation. Really 
uh, gave that 10,000 foot overview of, of genetics and that big picture, but then drilled all the way down of, of what it really means to us as beekeepers. If you want to learn more about that, um, uh, go to Debbie's website, read some of her work. Um, and learn a lot more about these different bee stocks because they really are um, a resource out there that, that you need to play ar around with. I want to remind everybody that in two weeks from today, we're going to have yet another uh, apiculture online. Um, Debbie's introduction here about the other types of bees was very timely in the sense that that's also going to be the topic of our Apiculture Online on June 17th. A PhD student in our program, uh, Hannah Levinson, has been doing a lot of work on bee communities, pollinator communities in North Carolina. And so she's going to talk about the non-honey bees that you can see this time of year. And then uh, she will then also interview Dr. Elsa Youngstead, who's a, a, a relatively new uh, faculty in applied ecology here at NC State, who was hired as the urban ecologist who happens to work on bees, including carpenter bees and other of these non-honeybee types. Um, and so if you're interested in, in the other types of bees and, and some of the things that Debbie touched on tonight, be sure to tune in two weeks from tonight. And so with that, thank you very much. Uh, everybody have a good evening and hopefully we'll see you in two weeks.